Hello everyone. My name is Prakar Kumar and today we are going to start the syllabus of optional syllabus for Indian history in UPSC. The lectures will cover in great detail and great length all the chapters and all the uh, you know the, the needed details for the history of India that are given in the syllabus of UPSC. And let me tell you once you go through this course it's so much comprehensively prepared that you won't need any other source for preparing your history. Why do I say this? Because the content and the subject matter that we are going to deliver you here, that I am going to deliver you here, has been collected from various sources, the various popular sources of history books that UPC students go through. And they have been accumulated at one point. And I will be delivering all those accumulated points, accumulated syllabus, one by one, chapter wise. For example, let's say there is this topic called nationalism in India after the arrival of Gandhi till 1930 or till 1929. So let's say the time period is 1915 to 1929. In 1915, Gandhi is arriving in India. And in 1929, the famous Lahore Congress is held. But this period is very vibrant. This period in Indian freedom movement has been very vibrant. Movement. If you read Shekhar Bandhupadhyay's book, you will find a different set of information there, in a, presented in a very different way. If you read Bipin Chandra's book, you will find a narration of story. If you read Ignu, the Ignu material, you will find again a very different set of uh, standards that are set for this period. The different sets of information are given in different ways. Different sets of um, information is available. Different sets of what to say that uh, I mean, interpretations are available. And since Igno books are you know they are they are made by various scholars of the same field collectively. That is why the Igno materials are also very rich. So in order to prepare this period, time period of 1915 to 1929, if you prepare as a student, you will have to go through three or four different sources. You will have to tabulate things. You will have to read each and every movement separately from different books and collect information. The best part of this format that I'm going to offer you is that all those info has already been collected at one place and it will be deli delivered to you at once point by point not leaving e even uh, a single uh, you know chance of topic being left but that is the best part of this uh, course structure okay uh, i think uh, this much is enough to introduce uh, let's start with the course and today uh, we will have a short demo class for the ancient history of India and the part that we are going to cover today is the prehistory and proto history of India. Let us start. Okay. For the sake of UPSC syllabus, I'm not going to discuss the concept of history here. Why I say this? Because it is not going to benefit you, you know, mostly in, in syllabus of history as far as UPSC is concerned. But to give an introduction, you must know that history is simply the study of past. If we go on to dwelling into great details of what is history, it will take another five to six class to deal only that. So we are not going to dwell into those details. Simply know that history is the study of past. And most of the time people confuse history with mere past, but all the all that all of that all of the things all of the events that happened in history that happened in past are in fact not a part of history so history is in fact i would say it's a selective study of past in order to understand an event in order to understand a certain trend you do a selective study of past you are not going to read all the details that happened in, within a certain time period you are going to very selectively study what is required for your uh, field of study and you will leave all the other details. For example, if I'm going to read about uh, the national movement in India, 
I won't study what Gandhi, what Gandhi's daily schedule was. I don't. I won't study at what time would he wake up at at what time would he have lunch. All I would do is study and find out the decisions taken by Gandhi when he was mobilizing the people. The you know popular movements launched by Gandhi. We will study about uh, you know how the negotiations went on between the Congress leadership and Gandhi and the Muslim League leadership towards the end of the freedom struggle. Now the, this this study is a selective study. If we go on at length at studying the you know life biography of Gandhi, we won't be focusing on the freedom struggle then. So that is why I am saying all that happened in past is not history. History is in fact very selective study of past. Now. Having said that, let's proceed. You see, Indian history is divided divided into three parts. When I say three parts, I do not mean ancient history, medieval history, and modern history. That is a, a very uh, later division. I mean these three terms, which I'm going to mention here. The first one is prehistory. You see, it is given here. This is the first division of Indian history. Second is proto history, and the third period that we famously called as history. So when we say the term history, we have to be very particular at what meanings we are conveying. When we say the term history, we do not refer to the period of prehistory and proto history. Okay, we refer to a certain period from where we had already developed the writing skills and apart from writing we had also developed language skills in short history is the period from where written sources are available and they are not merely available but they can also be understood by us they can also be deciphered by us now we will look into detail in coming slides. Let us start with prehistory. Let us start, let us go chronologically. So when we say prehistory, we are obviously talking about a period which is before history. Now, to your, to your surprise, let me tell you, prehistory is the largest period in the history of humans. It is the largest period. And if you ask me which is the smallest period, it has been the historical period, the period of history that we study in our books. So uh, it's not that prehistory is not studied in our books, but all I'm saying is from the time from when the written materials were available to us and which could be understood by uh, the historians of modern times, that time period of history is very small. In fact, it has been only 24 to 2500 years of historical period in India. But if you talk about prehistory, prehistory has been there since 5 million years ago and it, it continued till uh, 4000 BC, I guess. Now imagine the length of the time period that prehistory consumed. So it is the longest time period in the history of humans. And the worst part about prehistory is that most of the information about prehistory is not available with us. Most of the information about prehistory is lost. We do not know much about prehistory. Although it is the largest period in the history of humans, still we do not know much about it. Okay. See, there are no written sources, no written sources that were available in the prehistorical period in India. The prehistorical period in India starts from 5 million years ago and continues till 4000 BC. Now, when I say no written sources, then a question must rise here. If there were no written sources, then what kind of sources were there? Now, there are two kinds of sources that constructs history. The first is written sources. And the second is archaeological sources. So when there is no written sources, there must be some archaeological uh, sources based on which we recreated the history of prehistory. Okay. 
it is the largest period of human history and earth was still taking shape and man evolved humans were in the stage of evolution in the state in the times of prehistory they had not yet evolved into homo sapiens sapiens which is the smartest man first there were austropel Austro, uh, austropelithecus this is how it's pronounced i guess then came the homo habilis after that came the homo erectus homo erectus was followed by homo sapiens and homo sapiens was followed by homo sapiens sapiens the modern humans that we are today so in the prehistoric historical period the evolution of humans was still taking place so remember these two or three information about prehistory that is all you have to know for the sake of upsc nothing more than that we will deal into three phases of prehistory in great detail in coming classes then we will talk about the uh, paleolithic age and the mesolithic age and the uh, neolithic and chalcolithic ages okay now there is this name given here daniel wilson he was the person he was he must have been an archaeologist who came up with this term who came up with this term of prehistory and this term was given in 1851 now the question arises when archaeological uh, when the archaeologists study history how did how do they differentiate that which site is prehistoric and which site is historic there must be some criteria of differentiation right so there are some points given here you have to note it down first there won't there won't be any prominent habitation remains when we say when we talk about habitation remains we talk about settlements because settlements came very much late in the prehistoric period in the neolithic times for most of the part for, for the most of the time period in the human history the habitation remains or the settlements were not there because humans did not settle down by that time humans did not settle down until the start of the neolithic period in india in fact all over the world not only in india next we study prehistory principally via the fossils what are fossils you must have studied in geography fossils are the remains of dead plants and animals that got buried inside the soil inside the layers of the soil the layers of lithosphere thousands and millions of years ago some of the fossils got converted into fuels that we call fossil fuels today for example petroleum but some could not get converted into fuels and they still remain within the layers of earth and when you study them when you date them there is this system of carbon dating this that is a scientific system that has recently been developed so when you carbon date the fossils you exactly come to know to which time period does it belong to so mostly the prehistory of india or prehistory of the world is known by the study of fossils next found on the hill slopes of plateaus mountains and banks of the rivers and terraces i told you since there were no settlements no permanent settlements in the prehistoric period for most of the time people lived here and there people lived mostly at the at the at the at the locations where they would find easy water where they, they would where they would find uh, the the products of forests easily where they could you know get to places in order to gather food products and those places would be some hills some forest edges or beside the rivers it is not surprising why most of the civilizations most of the first cities of the world developed via the banks of the rivers you see this, the trend was there in the prehistoric period also now next you see there are stone tools that dominate when we say there are stone tools dominating we mean that there is no copper tools for the most period of in the in the stone age in the i mean prehistory of india is also called stone age because the stone tools predominate 
Now, when I say stone tools predominant, I don't mean to say that there were no copper tools or there were no there were no bronze tools. There might have I mean, bronze tools were very rare. Of course, there were no bronze tools. In fact, the bronze the mixing of uh, in the conversion of copper into bronze started very late during the times of Harappan civilization. So there was availability of copper. I'm not saying copper tools were absent. Copper tools started dominating much later in the prehistoric phase of India. That age is called Chalcolithic age. But before that, most of the tools that were made in India, made all over the world by the prehistoric humans, they were the stone tools. So they dominate. They dominate and copper tools are very less. Then there, there are remains of pre-ice age indicate this, which indicate that climatic conditions must have been very different at this time, as, at this uh, no, time period. When you study prehistoric period, there is a question, there is a problem. How do you determine the kind of climate that there was in prehistoric ages? That you get from the remains of pre-ice age period. There are various remains, plant remains, animal remains. And when you get those remains, you can determine the kind of climates that they used to live in. For example, if you discover a fossil of dinosaur, you can determine the kind of climate that they used to live in. That is, a, that is very scientifically dis, uh, determined. Okay. So these are some famous traits of some features of the settlements, not settlements, sorry. settlements is not the right term here. Some of the you know, features which define the prehistoric sites, not settlements. And they differentiate these features, differentiate these sites from the historical sites. Now, historical sites will be those sites wherein you also find written material. Right? For example, let's say you visit to a place which is called Takshila. Now, Takshila may be called a written, uh, may be called a historical site because in Takshila, there, were, there used to live a person called Chanakya and he had written this book, which is uh, Arthashastra. Now, since Arthashastra is a written material and since Arthashastra has also been deciphered, has also been understood by modern historians, so it can be referred to historical period. Okay. There is this name of very, this person is very famous, Robert B. Foote. In short, he's called Robert Foote and he's called father of Indian prehistory. You see, earlier it was understood that the prehistorical age in India is a descendant of the prehistorical age in the African continent or the European continent or the American continent. It was understood that the prehistorical age in India did not exist independently in India. However, Robert B. Foote for the first time established the fact that the prehistoric age in India was independent on its own and it developed on its own. How? Because he discovered this hand axe. He discovered this hand axe. It was a prehistoric tool. And this was the first tool to be discovered in the Indian subcontinent. The place was Pallavaram. It's in South India, Madras. You see, in 1863, it got established that in India also, there was a prehistory. Before that, people in India did not know that we have a prehistorical past also. Okay. But this tool gave the evidence that there was a full-fledged stone age in India also, not only in Western countries. This, this is the division of prehistory. About these, about these divisions, Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic, we will have different classes. We'll have one lecture for Paleolithic period. We will have one lecture for Mesolithic period. We will have another lecture for Mesolithic art. Mesolithic art has to be dealt differently. So we'll have in, in all two lectures for Mesolithic period. And then we will have one lecture for Neolithic, Chalcolithic period. Neolithic will always come with Chalcolithic period. You have to realize this. In fact, for Neolithic Chalcolithic, there may be more than one or two lectures because it's a larger uh, 
a chapter. The content in those that chapter is very large. Now let us look at the time period of prehistory. As I told you, it started 500 million years ago with the appearance of humans. When humans appeared on Earth, you must have studied the theory of evolution. Humans, you know, you will be surprised. Humans are very new to the Earth. Before humans, there has been there have been many many ice ages. There have been many uh, animals and many uh, plant remains, plant species that have got extinct and we are the newest races on the earth so we appeared on the earth some five five million years ago and it's it ended with the end advent of writing it ended with writing that was more or less about six thousand to four thousand years ago now in some places in the world it is six thousand years ago for example, in Egypt, Egypt, Egyptian civilization or Mesopotamian civilization. And in some places like India, it is somewhere around 4,000 years ago because writing was, you know, for, for the first time, writing was invented in, uh, in and around that period. For example, we can say that uh, Harappans had the knowledge of writing. However, we have not yet been able to decipher it. So Harappans are there in India around, in and around 2600 BC. To 1700 BC, or let's say 1900 BC, okay, somewhere around that. So this is almost 4500 years ago, 4000 to 4500 years ago from today. When we say years ago, we are referring to the time period from today. When we say BC, we are referring to the time period before the birth of Christ. When we say AD, that is. Onto, onto dominates. It's, it's not after death of Christ. People get confused. It's onto dominate. It's a uh, Latin word or Greek word. I don't know. And it means the period that is after the period of Jesus Christ. Next is proto history. So, having dealt with the features of prehistory, now we come to proto history. Why this term proto is given here? That is a very important question. Uh, there may be a question about proto-history in mains directly. There may be a question like proto-history fills in the gap between the two periods in India, that is prehistory and history, elaborate. We will have to answer. So proto-history is very important. You see the term proto literally means the first of its kind, the first evidence of something. This is what it roughly it means. I, I cannot exactly tell the meaning of proto. So why this term proto is attached here is the answer to this is related to the advent of writing. For the first time, writing appeared. I'm not saying that writing appeared and we were able to understand it. I'm not saying that. There are phases. First, In the first phase, there was no writing. That is the phase of prehistory. In the next phase, we had writing, but we have not yet been able to decipher it. That is the phase of proto-history. And then comes the historical period in which there was writing and we could also decipher it. The modern historians have been able to decipher the writings, the written materials available in those times. That is the historical period. So in the proto-history, which spans from start of Harappan period roughly till 500 BC. This is between the prehistory and history. That is very clear. And it is the period during which a culture or civilization has not yet developed, has, remember this, not, has not yet developed writing, but other cultures have already noted it, its existence in their own writings. For example, we may say that there was no writing during Vedic ages or in the Rig Vedic age or in Harappan age. But other contemporary cultures of that time, which know sufficiently about writing, may mention in their sources that there was a system of writing prevalent in later Vedic, early Vedic ages and Harappan culture in India. 
so now we know that there was writing however we don't know what kind of writing was it what meanings did it convey we didn't we don't know that we just know that there was some kind of writing so harappans fall under this chalcolithic cultures fall under this chalcolithic cultures also had writing but we don't know what kind of writing uh, that they practiced and it also includes the period of 1500 to 500 bc which is the rigvedic and later vedic ages this is the period of rigvedic and period of later vedic times okay here only orally transmitted literature existed but no writing again the earliest book that was written in india which is called the rigveda it was presented in written form very late i think it was in 1000 bc i think almost when max muller has dated the writing of rigveda on some manuscript but before that no evidence of writing of rig vedic uh, hymns are available to us the oldest that is available to us belongs to around 1000 bc that is also very much disputed so before that the rig vedic hymns used to exist in india in orally transmitted from form from generations to generations down down to the, the next generation so this is also a kind of existence of some sort of culture it's not always necessary that in order to preserve some culture you have to pen it down you have to write it down you can also orally transmit it down via generations and it can get preserved for example there is a very beautiful example to this for example in some temples in kerala even today even today after 3000 years of the demise of the vedic culture even today there is a section of people section of priests who chant these rig vedic hymns and they have not written it down they don't read the rig vedic hymns they have just remembered the hymns from their parents and this tradition has been alive since 3000 years in those temples they just hear the hymns they remember the themes hymns from their parents and they continue it down to their generations since 3000 years so that is a, a, a tradition of oral transmission so before there was literary you know uh, invention of penning down everything that you do there was system of oral transmission of knowledge that is why the idea of kanthast the idea of kanthast has been very popularized in the indian tradition okay let's proceed then so you see the proto history is the period in which we have the written material but we have not deciphered it we do not know what was it now there is a technical definition to prehistory also sorry proto history this technical definition has been given by archaeologists they say that proto history is a period it's a long period between the beginning of food production that is the neolithic period and advanced advent of iron technology so remember this first there was stone age then came copper age then came copper or bronze age or let's say bronze age existed before the copper age i mean we know that harappans knew the art of uh, framing um, bronze um, bronze statues but later on the art of uh, art of creating bronze was disappeared and um, the chalcolithic period did not know how to make bronze they all they, they knew all they knew was to use copper and then they came the iron age so iron age is the start of historical period when writing was also invented when writing was also not invented but it was given its meaningful form it was given a language it was given a grammar so that we could understand it we live in iron age today is an iron age so iron age started roughly around 500 to 500 bc roughly around 600 to 500 bc this was the start of iron age 
this was the start of uh, age in india when buddha and mahavira and their uh, new religions were propagated and this was the start of the time period when private property the idea of private property got introduced in india then when uh, large kingdoms were introduced new cities emerged and various other features uh, are there which can be given to it to this period so the the technical technically the division uh, the proto history is the is the period which is from the beginning of food production from the neolithic period till the advent of iron technology in india okay now so beginning of historical period in india from which the written materials are available the written sources are available to us is the fourth the, the time period of 4th century bc this is in north india sorry north india in north india it started around 4th century bc or 400 bc but in south india the the historical period was late to arrive it started from 400 to 200 bc so it started within a span of 200 years so it was late to arrive in south india it arrived earlier in northern india okay now again you have to see one more thing here let me clear the board first sorry from where do i clear the board where is the option bond yes okay so what i was saying to you is that when we started writing when we started producing written material the materials which were written were produced on perishable material this perishable material was called manuscripts manu means hand scripts mean writing so a material which is hand written manuscript literally means hand written and when we say perishable it was perishable because it could rot it could not survive longer time period for longer time period for example because it was written basically uh, either on tree leaves or the bark of the tree tree uh, bark of the trees so these periods are very much perishable they they get destroyed over a longer period of time and they cannot be preserved so they have to re they have to be reproduced time and again so we will study about manuscripts separately when we do the sources of history that is another uh, chapter in all okay in south india it started from 400 to 200 bc and the evidence for that comes from three sources let us look at the first source first source is the brahmi inscription from anuradhapur anuradhapur is a place in sri lanka sri lanka was called ceylon okay so anuradhapur is a place from where we get a brahmi inscription inscription we, what is in what are inscriptions we will talk about that also for now just know that inscriptions are writings on hard surfaces that hard surface may be a rock may be a cemented plate may be a copper plate may be some other kinds of uh, hard surface so uh, whenever you engrave something on hard surface that is called an inscription okay <clears throat> and brahmi is a language brahmi is a language and there will be more languages coming up in the coming chapters so there is this 4th century inscription there inscriptions are sources of study of history and which suggest that the this was in fact the first proof that the historical period had started in south india okay second one comes from tamil brahmi inscription again it might be somewhere in south india only source is not given here it's not necessary and the last one is sangam literature we will uh, read about this in great detail when we do the literary literary um, traditions in ancient india so there will we'll cover the lit sangam literature now this is an interesting fact given here if the harappan script is deciphered which we have not yet been able to decipher because uh, the contemporary periods of harappa which was egyptian and mesopotamian both had their scripts and they have been deci deci deciphered 
okay the hieroglyphic script and one more is i'm forgetting the name it's slipping my mind both have been de deciphered so people know what they wrote in egyptian times but we we have got a sign board from harappan times and we have not yet able to yet yet, yet able to know that uh, what those signs mean so we have been i mean i mean the harappan script has still been deciphered so if it gets deciphered the historical period in north india will be pushed to third millennium bc because if it gets deciphered that means that is the start of writing okay and the historical period will be pushed further back now it starts from 400 bc around 400 bc <clears throat> so history is the part of human history human past which comes after the invention of writing this is very important now what are the features of historical period till now we have done the features of prehistorical period let us revise we have done the features of prehistory okay then we come to proto history we did the features of proto history also and now we have come to historical period features of historical period first there will be a language languages are spoken symbols and they can exist even without writing this is very important languages i told you about the oral traditions so languages may exist with or without writing writing or script is not necessary for a language to exist next there has to be writing writing may be in scripts there may there may be visual communication using signs and symbols okay now when writing was invented it it created some very revolutionary changes in in the the way humans lived because now we could store information before that in the oral traditions yeah some information could be stored by remembrance but that faded away after a period of time but now when you pen down everything you can store it you can store it for longer period for future generations you don't have to you know transmit it orally and you don't have the problem of getting it forgotten so you can literally store it next store the knowledge the storation of knowledge started rulers used it to advertise and exercise power for example ashoka ashoka had built his inscriptions all over india now in fact archaeologists knew the limits of ashoka's territories just by knowing where those inscriptions are placed now how fascinating is that it is only because of the art of writing that we know about the limits of the territories of ashoka had it not been there we wouldn't we wouldn't ever know so rulers used to advertise their rules they used to exercise power through it. for example ashoka wrote various rules about what to do what not to do according to the dharma of buddha in those inscriptions or the pillar inscriptions that he engraved all over india in various places next merchants used to record transactions there was this new merchant class that was emerging around 600 bc we will deal with it in coming chapters it's very very interesting this is the this is the this is a very um, introductory chapter that is why i am giving some glimpses of what is about to come so there is there is this new class of merchants and traders that started emerging in the society of 600 bc or 500 bc in which there was this uh, start of buddhism and jainism and it they started recording transactions via the use of writing only priests used to preserve the religious text the texts of mahabharata the text of ramayana how does it reach us because they were preserved by priests in the written form if writing had not been invented it could not have been possible for us for us to know the story of ramayana how fascinating is that a poets to give sorry yeah it was used by poets to give permanence to their expressions and it was used by or oh, sorry it coincided with the emergence of cities and states i told you the cities and states started in 600 bc the first cities and first states appeared monarchical states the kingdoms the janapadas they are called mahajanapadas 16 mahajanapadas were there so for the start of the great mahajanapadas for their administrative structure for their maintenance writing was very much useful 
without writing they could not administer without writing they could not expand their territories next there is this written evidence available to the historian when a historian in modern times sits to reconstruct the history of a particular time period for him it's easier because he can directly refer to the written sources and he can match those written sources with the archaeological sources next you have to realize is that in the historical period after the invention of writing it's not that oral trans oral transmission you know it evaded it's not that oral transmission did not end abruptly it continued i told you it continues even till today so oral transmission continued even with the advent of writing that is very important thing for example in neolithic period with the start of agriculture with the start of settled agriculture it is not that domestication you know uh, evaded or domesticated domestication ended or hunting gathering ended hunting gathering and domestication continue with the start of agriculture also it continues till till today people might be writing on perishable material that those are the manuscripts from 1900 bc to 400 bc this is the period of proto history they might be writing on the manuscripts but that those manuscripts got rotten down and we have nothing today for this period as we all know now in mesopotamia there was the script called cuneiform script i told you and in egypt there was hieroglyphics both have been deciphered but harappan script has not been deciphered okay in the cuneiform script you see there there were letters on moist clay tablets they wrote on tablets tablets of clay clay means clay means uh, it's, it's it's a form of soil so so when you mix soil uh, very very fine quality of soil with water you can make a slate out of it that is the clay tablet and then you can write something on it and hieroglyphics was written on papyrus sheet papyrus sheets made of reeds so you don't have to get into details of it for now just leave it because these are out of syllabus things but you must know this since i mean some facts should be known to us it's not that we can skip everything the oldest script of india is harappan and oldest deciphered script of india is brahmi okay these are some extra boosting information you must remember this okay then starts the geographical factor section in this section i will explain you in the next class how geographical features how geographical factors shaped the climate and the society and the economy of paleolithic mesolithic and neolithic people because in all these sections in all these sections of history periods of history different kinds of climatic and geographical conditions existed and those conditions shaped the lives of the people so before formally starting with the lives of people in mesolithic uh, paleolithic and uh, neolithic period we will first determine what were the geographical factors in those times that existed in india and after that we will cover each of them in great details okay so let's leave it for another class since this is a demo class i won't be teaching for long um i mean if we start uh, let's hope that we start if we start uh, each class would be of i think in and around for 2 hours with one or two breaks in between short breaks and we will keep on covering these chapters one by one it's a very interesting journey let me tell you let me show you some pictures i have also added some slides some pictures to it yeah look at this person arun sonakia he is a person who is told to who is said to have discovered the first skull cap that is located at a place called hathnora hathnora if i am not mistaken is in and around narmada valley okay these are the first hominid remains first hominid remains remain in 
Indian subcontinent. In the Indian subcontinent. Now, who are hominids? Hominids are human-like apes. Who, for the first time, look like humans, behave like humans. They are called hominids. The first time the hominid remains were found in the place called Hathnora. And the person was Arun Sonaki. Okay, let's see other pictures. Yes, this is very interesting. It's smaller. Let me make it smaller. Yes. This is how ancient tools were made, especially in the period of this Paleolithic. Sorry. Especially in the period of Paleolithic age and Mesolithic age. This is how stone tools were made. There is this stone which is used to hit the main stone. And when you hit it, it gets divided into two parts. The main part, the larger one will be called core. And the smaller one will be called flake. So out of these flakes, there were flake tools that were created. So we'll study about how different kinds of stone tools were created. Direct questions are asked in UPSC based on stone tools and based on each of these periods. <clears throat> See, these, this is the main core tool and three kinds of flakes have been created out of this. These are called flake tools. The precursion, pre, uh, precursion uh, technique of the making flakes. Sorry, the percussion techniques of making flakes. But these are some of the tools which belong to Mesolithic period. Sorry. Mesolithic period. These are microliths. Micro means smaller. In the Mesolithic period, what happened? The stone tools became smaller. Okay. And it, the, 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 the edges became finer. Okay, this is a prehistoric painting. These are examples of Mesolithic art. We'll deal with each of them separately in different chapters. Mesolithic art is often asked in questions, the arts of Bhimbetka. Bhimbetka has always been asked. So yes, this was the demo class. Uh, we'll continue with all the other chapters. We'll first cover the ancient history syllabus. Then we'll move see, I mean, uh, serially. We will not jump into modern and medieval all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden start art and culture. We'll move uh, in, in a serial voice manner and we'll cover each and every chapters of the ancient first. Then we'll get to medieval India and then we get to the modern India. Okay, let's hope uh, we get to start these classes. I'm very excited. Thank you so much. Also, let me tell you uh, one more thing. I can also teach in Hindi. I can also teach in English. T today I taught in English. I can also use English. I can also Hindi and English. I think that if I teach in English, I can teach in English and English. I can English in English and English. I can teach 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 in English. और अच्छा है दो languages होते हैं तो हम ज़्यादा बेहतरीन तरीके से express कर पाते हैं खुद को I I've, I've you know have this experience of studying somewhere with that people who know more than two languages or at least two languages are more expressive of course they have to be because they know they have learned more ways to express themselves so I think um, English would be will be better uh, because English में reach कम हो जाएगा तो ठीक है continue करते हैं thank you so much